talked with small business owners across the state who are just praying for some crucial support so that they can keep their doors open. Every single one of us knows someone who's been hit hard by this pandemic. A healthcare worker, a grocery store employee, a business owner who spent their entire lives building up a business that is now on the brink. Every day I think about these men and women and their families and their employees, people who have made incredible sacrifices to keep our communities safe. And every day I pledge that I will do everything in my power to give them the support that they need and deserve. As long as I'm governor, Michigan's families, frontline workers, and small businesses will have a fighter for them in Lansing. But I can't do it alone. I need partners from the state and from the federal level to work with me to protect public health and to jumpstart our economy. And I have a plan to do just that. Today, my administration is announcing the Michigan COVID Recovery Plan so that we can grow our economy as we work to end the COVID-19 pandemic. The Michigan COVID Recovery Plan is focused on, one, protecting public health, two, getting our students back on track, and three, jump-starting our economy. The most important thing that we can do to grow our economy and to help businesses get back on their feet is to protect public health and end the pandemic. And that's why a part of the Michigan COVID recovery plan is to ramp up vaccine distribution so we can get more shots in arms, so we can return to a strong economy and get back to normal as soon as possible. Last month, Congress appropriated $90 million in additional resources for vaccine distribution in Michigan through the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. My plan is to use this federal funding to scale up vaccine distribution in Michigan and bring us closer to our goal of 50,000 shots in arms per day. Michigan will also receive $575 million to expand COVID testing, tracing, and lab capacity in Michigan. I've been working closely with our departments across state government to develop a number of new initiatives that will help us jumpstart our economy under the Michigan COVID recovery plan. Our business owners who've been hit the hardest by this pandemic, and we are doing everything that we can to make sure that they've got the support they need. The MEDC has developed a number of new programs to help our small business owners get through this tough winter and get back on their feet. The Michigan Main Street Initiative, it will help stabilize our small business community by securing grants for restaurants and other place-based businesses to keep our main streets vibrant and our communities resilient. The Michigan Micro Enterprise Support Initiative will help us put small businesses uh, with a lens with less than nine employees on the path to recovery by creating greater access to much needed support and the Business Accelerator and Resiliency Initiative will provide grants to high-tech startups that can help our communities thrive. The Michigan COVID Recovery Plan also appropriates hundreds of millions of federal dollars in rental, housing, and food assistance to help families who need it most. And to help families and businesses in Michigan's rural communities, I'm creating the Office of Rural Development charged with coordinating work across state government to address issues facing rural communities, including broadband, talent, infrastructure, and more. Our small businesses are fixtures in their communities. Some have been around for decades. They're working around the clock to stay afloat while trying to keep their communities safe from COVID-19, and they deserve as much support as we can give them. Let's make Michigan the place where people come to restart their businesses. I also urge the legislature to pass Good Jobs for Michigan, legislation that will boost our economy and create good paying jobs. The Good Jobs for Michigan program provides Michigan businesses with a crucial tool to create jobs and thrive in our state. Little known fact, but Pfizer was the first business to utilize Good Jobs for Michigan and did so to build their sterile drug manufacturing plant in Portage, creating 450 good paying jobs. That's right, the same Portage, Michigan plant where the first doses of Pfizer's safe, effective and approved vaccine shipped from at the end of last year that gave all of us such pride to see on the national news, Michigan being the epicenter of hope. Pfizer is proof 
that good jobs for Michigan legislation can boost our economy and create jobs. It's time for the legislature to get this passed and get to my desk. I'm also once again calling on the Michigan legislature to permanently extend the unemployment benefits from 20 to 26 weeks. At the end of last year, I signed legislation that extend benefits through the end of March, as soon as the legislature removes the tie bar to a $220 million tax giveaway. It's time to stop playing games and for both parties in the legislature to roll up their sleeves and to get this done. Let's permanently extend these benefits to 26 weeks, no strings attached. Let's increase the weekly benefit and provide some much needed support for Michiganders who've lost work. I'll also continue to work with the federal government to address the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. Michigan's was built up over the last decade and was in great shape prior to the pandemic. Help from the federal government would be beneficial for Michigan families, our business community, and our economy as a whole. Due to the pandemic and economic crisis, all 50 states have drained trust funds, and it's gonna take a national effort to solve this crisis. I'm committed to working with the incoming administration to address it so we can provide working families with the financial security and peace of mind that they need and deserve. Last, the Michigan recovery uh, the Michigan COVID Recovery Plan will help our students and educators get back on track. As a part of recent actions from the federal government, Michigan was allocated nearly $1.7 billion through the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. The My COVID Recovery Plan will allocate this federal funding along with an additional $300 million in state funds to help schools meet our goal of providing every student an in-person learning opportunity by March 1, and to help address the learning loss that has occurred due to this pandemic. These one-time flexible dollars will be distributed through a formula that recognizes the additional costs that are associated with supporting students who are in poverty and students with special education needs. This cru crucial action will provide our students and educators with the support they need as we return to in-person learning this spring. I was proud to work with the legislature on a bipartisan supplemental budget to protect our small business owners. We did that back in December. We can take strong bipartisan action again on behalf of Michiganders everywhere. The Michigan COVID Recovery Plan will provide our businesses, families, frontline workers, and educators with the support they need as we continue to work to eradicate this virus. It'll help us get more shots in arms and ramp up vaccination distribution. Help us get our kids back on track in our schools. And it's an opportunity to join forces to protect our state. Let's work together and let's get it done. And with that, I'd like to welcome the budget director, Dave Masseron, for to make some, some remarks. Thank you, Governor. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is just take a second to step back and talk a little bit about um, where the funding is coming from for uh, the Michigan COVID recovery plan. Um, as Treasurer Eubanks will describe in a minute, the state had better than expected revenues as a result of the pandemic uh, not being, uh, having as large of an impact on the economy as was expected. That coupled with federal support of general fund activity and school activities um, has created additional one-time funds in the general fund and school aid fund that can be used to make prudent investments to help um, our residents recover from the pandemic. The other major component of the funding that uh, is part of the Michigan COVID recovery plan is federal funding. The federal government in December of last year adopted a major recovery bill, which provided a tremendous amount of funding because of the advocacy of this governor and because of the advocacy of people throughout the state and making use of that funding um, that the entire country has given each state and local government uh, is vitally important. The governor has covered many of the uh, programmatic areas. I just would like to underline a couple um, of the uh, programs that the federal government funded that I think is vitally important to immediately get out. The rental assistance fund, which pays for people to stay um, in their apartments uh, and pay their rent. It also enables people to pay uh, utility bills. P 
people who are struggling to pay need this money. The most recent program we had served over 16,000 residents. This is 10 times that amount of funding and there's utility assistance and rental assistance that's available. The reason it is so very important that the legislature act is if this funding is not spent to the tune of $50 million a month, we need to send it back to Washington, DC. And at a time when our residents need this type of support, we need to give it to them rather than send the money back uh, to the federal government. The other component of this that I just would like to frame out, um, in total, we will be sending the request to the legislature tomorrow. It is $5.6 billion. Um, 575 million of it is state tax dollars. That, those are those one-time funds that occurred because of federal support and because expenses came in lower than we expected. The rest of the funding is federal funding. It is money that was sent to us to help our residents recover from uh, the pandemic. And it's vitally important that we immediately take that federal funding that everybody advocated for and get it out to our residents. With that, I believe I would turn it over to Treasurer Eubanks to discuss the revenues and economy. Thank you, Governor Whitmer and Director Masseron. On Friday, we held the first Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference of 2021. While the revenue projections are still down more than $1 billion for fiscal year 2021, compared to the projections from before the pandemic, the state's revenues were raised upwards, primarily due to indirect impacts from the federal stimulus. Our economic recovery this year will continue to depend on the course of the pandemic and the additional economic relief coming from Washington, DC. There is cautious hope and optimism as we move forward, as vaccines are administered and we begin to put the pandemic behind us. This is why the Michigan COVID recovery plan is so important. It uses federal funding to promote and administer the vaccine rollout and expand COVID testing and tracing. As we progress on the health front, our economic recovery will continue to follow. We expect a two track recovery over the next couple of years. Businesses and industries that require a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with customers, such as restaurants and bars, hotels, and brick and mortar retail are likely to lag behind industries that can operate remotely or socially distance. The extended unemployment benefits along with food and rental assistance are necessary to support the individuals and families impacted by the pandemic and reduced volume these businesses have faced throughout the pandemic. The plan also includes funding to waive penalties and interest for certain property owners who were not able to pay their summer 2020 property taxes on time as a result of the economic hardship created by the COVID-19 pandemic. The plan not only helps individuals and families, it also calls for crucial support for our small businesses. The new initiatives introduced today in the Michigan COVID Recovery Plan allow us to invest in the small businesses that have been most impacted, which are the same businesses that make up the fabric of our communities. These businesses need additional support to help speed their recovery. The Michigan Main Street Initiative is included in this plan and will provide a combination of capital access expansion and direct grants to support retailers and restaurants. There is also proposed funding for support for our smallest businesses those with fewer than nine employees, which make up more than half of Michigan's businesses. Supporting these businesses is critical to helping us return to a normal economy. While the pandemic has had a dramatic impact on our economy, the state of Michigan has outperformed or kept pace with national averages in a number of key areas. First, economic spending in Michigan outperformed US averages throughout the summer and fall of 2020. We also noticed a shift from spending on services to spending on taxable durable goods. Michigan's unemployment rate was initially much higher than the US rate, but has recovered at a faster rate and is now keeping pace with US averages. And the housing market has been strong. Home prices in the De De Detroit metropolitan area are up 10% year over year and mortgage rates are at record lows. We do expect a robust recovery once we get COVID under control, which this plan will help us do. The pandemic created a sharp plunge into recession 
Even with healthy growth, we are looking at a multi-year recovery process. Public health and the economy go together. We will not have a normal economy again until the public health situation is under control. Federal aid will continue to be critically important to supporting our state's economy and revenues, and so will the Michigan COVID recovery plan. The programs and initiatives Governor Whitmer has proposed in this plan will go a long way to providing the support needed to restore Michigan's economy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. All right, great. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, so the first question will come from Rick Alvin with TV8. I think that, um, can you hear me now? <clears throat> okay, great. Um, pardon me, the two part question. The first part is a reporter doing math. So uh, you're looking for $575 million from tax revenue here in the state and the rest of this money is a federal allocation that the legislature has to sign off on, is, is that right? I, I see the budget director nodding. I'm gonna let, let the budget director uh, help you out there, Rick. Thank you. Yeah, Rick, you're 100% right. 274 million of it's from the general fund and 300 million is from the school aid fund. The balance is from federal funding. Okay, so I've got that part of this story straight. Governor, while I have you here, if I may, can I get you to weigh in on your decision to go to the inauguration? Yeah, so, you know, Rick, I am a co-chair for the Presidential Inaugural Committee. Um, we are encouraging Americans everywhere to take part virtually. Uh, that was always the plan, frankly, because of COVID. Um, but uh, as a, a member of the committee, when the pre president-elect asked me to be here in Washington, D.C., it's an honor. I had not decided actually until yesterday uh, whether or not I was going to be able to make it, but I do think that it's an, an important thing. This relationship is incredibly important and I think going to be a, a strong uh, one for the state of Michigan. And so I am I am glad to be here and um, I feel very uh, safe and I am um, you know, grateful that uh, President-elect Biden has asked me to I uh, take such uh, a leadership role in, in a variety of ways, frankly, and I look very much forward to working with him. Thank you, Governor. Okay, great. We'll go to Eric. Hello, Governor. I was just wondering, with the vaccine portion of this plan, we've been hearing for weeks uh, the issues have been availability. Um, we've been hearing that now the nation doesn't have reserves. Um, and then we've been taking time trying to get the delivered vaccine doses and making them administered. How is throwing more money at this going to help the process? Well, Eric, thank you for the question. Um, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. I was, I, I wish I could say I was surprised, but I was incredibly disheartened to see the news at the end of last week that after representations from the Trump administration that they'd been holding vaccines back and after they decided to quote unquote release them at the request of Michigan and uh, eight other states, we find out that there was never any vaccines held back. And so they flat out were being dishonest with us. It's maddening because I know we are in a race here. We are racing against a variant that has now been detected in Michigan that is highly contagious. Maybe not more deadly, but the more people that get it, we know the more fatalities. And so we are in a race to vaccinate people. I have asked that Michigan have uh, permission of the federal government because that's necessary so that we can buy directly from Pfizer. We know that in their freezer farms, there are millions of vaccines. Uh, I would love for Michigan to be able to purchase those at the very least. Um, I know that beginning tomorrow, we'll have a new administration that takes the science very seriously. I have great confidence in the plan that they have to increase the number of vaccines that are available for states. We want to be doing 50,000 vaccinations a day. If we hit our stride at that number, it'll take six months to get 70% of our population vaccinated. If we continue at the slog that we have been, where we're getting 60,000 a week, where we want to do 50,000 a day, it will take over two years to get 70% vaccinated. So this is crucial that the United States uh, buy every vaccine that has been allotted to us. We haven't made that purchase yet, and I cannot get a straight answer out of the administration why that's the case. 
and that we move swiftly to get vaccine, vaccines to the states. I believe that's going to happen under the Biden administration. I know they've got a great plan, and that's why it's a cru crucial that we build out the apparatus so that when those vaccines are coming in faster, that we're able to get shots in arms. We want to run out of vaccines every day, which keeps us at the top of the list for more vaccines. It's, um, it's, and it's a race against this variant, as I said, as well. So that's what those resources are going to go for. So we can build up the apparatus and continue to do the COVID testing and, and everything else that we need to do during this period of time until we hit that 70% um, number. Thank you, Governor. For time, we can take just a few more questions. So we'll go to Kim Scube at this time. Governor, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Governor, uh, is your proposal DOA, given what the Republican Chairman of House Appropriations has said, which basically, unless you open the economy, he will not talk to you about your plan? Your reaction, <laughs> ma'am? No, I know that sometimes, uh, especially in this political environment, that um, people want to draw firm lines. But here, let me just tell you something real quick. I know that the Republican legislature would never want to stand in the way of making sure that these federal dollars get to our kids' schools or to our ability to build up our apparatus to get people vaccinated, our public health. I know that the Republican legislature wouldn't stand in the way of aid for businesses that are struggling right now. That's what this COVID recovery plan is. That's what this supplemental is. In fact, I know that uh, the current leader in the Senate and the most previous, as well as the current leader in the House, traveled to Washington, D.C. in December, and they said that they were there to advocate for more resources. So I'm sure that they wouldn't stand in the way of us putting these dollars into work and run the risk of having the federal government pull them back. And so it's crucial that the action is taken. We want people to stay safe. I'm uh, glad that they've been wise about their schedule this week, but we really need to get moving in this. And to the premise of your question, the economy's not been shut down. Uh, I know that there are unique parts of our economy that have struggled because of the nature of how this virus spreads. But uh, there are a number of, of businesses, whether you're talking about in the restaurant industry, if that's perhaps what you're alluding to, who have been doing takeout, have gotten creative. My hope is that the numbers that we are seeing, Michigan's, uh, our, our pause has been working. We're in a stronger position than our Midwest neighbors. Um, and I, my hope is that we see these numbers continue and that we're able to re-engage more fully those sectors, but, but none has been shut down. So is this a hoax then? It's just a head fake? I, I can't speak to the intentions. Uh, I don't know if it was it, it, if, if it was a representation that was made without really understanding all of the crucial pieces of this these federal dollars um, that that people are desperately needing to see get into our economy, whether it's in the businesses or in our kids' classrooms or helping people who are unemployed. That's what these dollars are, and I, I'm sure that no one would want to stand in the way of them getting to where they're intended to be. Okay, we'll go to Kirk Mason with WWMT. All right, Governor, can you hear me? Yes. Well, Governor, some are expressing frustration over who they are seeing receive the vaccine. In some cases, people who are working from home, not over 65, don't have an underlying condition. In some cases, they are getting the shot. What steps are you taking to try and make sure people who are supposed to get the vaccine are getting it and preventing people from cutting in line? Yeah, so I, I don't think that it's a necessarily people cutting in line, perhaps in some instances. I will say that the nature of these vaccines, because the way that they are stored and transported, requires uh, specific refrigeration. Recently, we were made aware that a number of the Moderna vaccines that uh, were shipped to Michigan were not kept at the appropriate temperature and thus we couldn't use them. That frustrates me when I know we are in a race and every vaccine matters, but that's not something that I could control. It's not the state of Michigan's fault. It's just what happened with the vaccine. And so we have to be nimble. And I'm certain that people who had appointments uh, who were scheduled at facilities that were supposed to get those particular shots were frustrated because they, they weren't able to get them. 
that's part of the bumpy road that is um, that we're all experiencing nationwide. And and I just share that with you as one example of of the frustration. Another is, of course, early on, uh, we were supposed to be getting 300,000 vaccines a week, but we're getting 60. Uh, we scaled up, we had a, you know, we still have a great plan to scale up when the vaccines come, but they've not been coming in nearly at the pace that, that we really need. So I understand people's frustration. I'll just add one other thing. When a, a um, package of the vaccines is opened, when it's thawed and open, you have a small window with which those need to be administered. And if perhaps some appointments aren't kept, some people for whatever reason don't make it to their appointment, we don't want to run the risk of letting a vaccine go bad. Um, and so we will, uh, you know, the people that are administering vaccines will look for other eligible folks first. But if it's a question of whether or not the vaccine is going to be a total loss or someone who's not in those first priorities or is getting that vaccine, we hope that they're making sure that they get that vaccine in an arm. And so these are some of the real world challenges that we're confronting in real time. Uh, we're navigating them, but all of these uh, would be addressed if we had enough vaccines. And that's precisely why I'm continuing our push to get more vaccines into Michigan. Because if we have plentiful vaccines and everyone who wants one can get one, we won't have to worry about the priority and if people are skipping line. But at this juncture, I think it's important that we remember the minuscule number that we're getting compared to the population that wants them and recognize we got to make an appointment and, and be patient and it might take longer to make an appointment. You might be on that appointment schedule pretty far out. Um, but we, I, you've got, I'm making a promise. Everyone who wants a vaccine is going to get one. Well, I just got to get more into the state of Michigan. We're, we're making progress. You've seen our numbers triple and quadruple over the first week that we were doing this. Um, so we really are in a much stronger position. We're going to get we're going to get better and stronger and faster every day when those vaccines come rolling in. All right, great, Governor. The last question will come from Zach Gorchild with Bungle. Uh, hi, Governor. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, it's sort of a, a two part question here. First, uh, on the vaccines topic, do you think the state should consider pulling back to just uh, eligibility for those in that 1A group, uh, uh, given the, the shortage of available vaccines, that that might help alleviate the crush of appointments that are going on. Uh, there's been some criticism that your administration moved, moved too soon to expand to the 1B group. Uh, and then uh, on the comments that uh, Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky made to JTV, the Jackson television station, that he's been meeting with uh, some of the leaders of, of militia groups uh, trying to offer them guidance on how best to conduct themselves. I, I was wondering if you could react to that. So, uh, Zach, first, you know, I, I would say that uh, opening up uh, who could get a vaccine actually is a way to make sure that we don't waste vaccines. Uh, the CDC, in fact, mirrored our our new policy and so that it is the, the right one because we want to make sure we don't waste a single vaccine. So moving to 65, you've seen other states follow our lead and the CDC embrace it as a policy as well for that very reason. We just don't want to risk um, rendering a vaccine um, you know, uh, useless because there wasn't someone in the specific eligible group um, and, it, and the, the, um, you know, the date or the timestamp um, you know, we, we didn't get the vaccine out before it happened and it needs to be disposed of. We just don't want to, we don't want to waste any vaccines. We can't afford to. Uh, with regard to the second part of your question, I guess I would, I would just say, um, you know, I, I don't know how to respond to the revelation that the Senate majority leader has been meeting with militia groups to help them um, on their messages. I, I think it's clear he's got to answer some tough questions. Um, what what groups did he meet with? Were any of them involved in the plot to kidnap and murder me? Were any involved in the insurrection in Washington? I think those are, are legitimate questions that um, I'm sure we'd all love to know the answer to. Thank you, 